Sanctifier, Caesarian, Catholic Majesty, the Emperor Don Carlos, our Lord King. Royal and Redoubtable Majesty, our King Paramount, from this city of Mexico, capital of New Spain, this day of St. Paphnutius, martyr, in the year of our Lord 1530. Greeting. It is typically thoughtful of our condolent sovereign that you commiserate with your majesty's protector of the Indians, and that you ask for more details of the problems and obstacles we daily confront in that office. Heretofore, sire, it was the practice of the Spaniards who were granted land holdings in these provinces to appropriate also the many Indians already living thereon, and to brand their cheeks with the G for Guerra, and to claim them as prisoners of war, and cruelly to treat and exploit them as such. That practice has at least been ameliorated to the extent that an Indian can no longer be sentenced to slave labor unless and until he is found guilty of some crime, by either the secular or the ecclesiastical authorities. Also, the law of Mother Spain is now more strictly applied in this new Spain, so that an Indian here, like a Jew there, has the same rights as any Christian Spaniard, and cannot be condemned for a crime without due process of charge, trial, and conviction. But of course, the testimony of an Indian, like that of a Jew, even of converts to Christianity, cannot be allowed equal weight against the testimony of a lifelong Christian. Hence, if a Spaniard desires to acquire as a slave some robust red man or personable red woman, all he need do, in effect, is to lodge against that Indian any accusation that he has the wit to invent. Because we beheld the conviction of many Indians on charges that were moot at best, and because we feared for the souls of our countrymen who were apparently aggrandizing themselves and their estates by sophistical means unbecoming to Christians, we were saddened and we felt moved to action. Wielding the influence of our title as protector of the Indians, we have succeeded in persuading the judges of the Audiencia that all Indians to be branded henceforth must be registered with our office. Therefore the branding irons are now kept locked in a box which must be opened with two keys, and one of the keys resides in our possession. Since no convicted Indian can be branded without our cooperation, we have consistently refused to cooperate in those cases that are flagrant abuses of justice, and those Indians have perforce been reprieved. Such exercise of our office as protector of the Indians has earned us the odium of many of our countrymen, but that we can bear with equanimity knowing that we act for the ultimate good of all involved. However, the economic welfare of all New Spain might suffer, and the king's fifth of its riches be diminished, if we too adamantly obstructed the recruitment of the slave labor on which depends the prosperity of these colonies. So now, when a Spaniard is desirous of acquiring some Indian for a bondsman, he does not invoke the secular arm. He charges the Indian with being a Christian convert who has committed some lapsus fidei. Since our prelacy as defender of the faith takes precedence over all our other offices and concerns, we do not in those cases withhold the brand. Thus we simultaneously accomplish three things that we trust will find favor in your majesty's sight. Primus, we effectually prevent the misfeasance of the civil law. 
Second this, we steadfastly uphold church dogma as it regards lapsed converts. Tertius, we do not impede the maintenance of a steady and adequate labor supply. Incidentally, Your Majesty, the brand on the convict's cheek is no longer the demeaning G, which imputes the dishonor of defeat in war. We now apply the initials of the slave's designated owner, unless the convict is a comely woman whom the owner prefers not to deface. Besides being a mark to identify property and runaways, such a branding eventually serves also to mark those slaves who are hopelessly rebellious and unfit for work. Many such intractable malcontents, having passed through several changes of ownership, now bear numerous and overlapping initials upon their faces, as if their skin were a palimpsest manuscript. There is touching evidence of your compassionate majesty's goodness of heart in this same latest letter, when you say of our Aztec chronicler, anent the death of his woman, although of inferior race, he seems a man of human emotions, capable of feeling happiness and hurts quite as keenly as we do. Your sympathy is understandable, since your majesty's own abiding love for your queen Isabella and your baby son Felipe is a tender passion remarked and much admired by all. However, we respectfully suggest that you expend not too much pity on persons whom your majesty cannot know as well as we do, and especially not on one who, over and over again, shows himself undeserving of it. This one may in his time have felt an occasional emotion, or entertained an occasional human thought which would do no discredit to a white man. But your majesty will have noticed that, though he professes to be now a Christian, the old dotard maundered much about his dead mates still wandering the world. And why? because she did not have a certain green pebble by her when she died. Also, as your majesty will perceive, the Aztec was not long cast down by his bereavement. In these ensuing pages of the narrative, he again ramps like a colossus, and behaves in his old accustomed ways. Sire, not long ago, we heard a priest wiser than ourself say this, that no man should be unreservably lauded while he still lives and still sails upon the unpredictable seas of life. Not he nor anyone can know whether he will survive all the besetting tempests and the lurking reefs and the distracting siren songs to make safe harbor at last. That man alone can rightly be praised whom God has guided so that he finishes his days in the port of salvation, for the Gloria is sun only at the end. May that guiding Lord God continue to smile upon and favor your imperial majesty, whose royal feet are kissed by your chaplain and servant. Ecce Signum, Sumeraga. My own personal tragedy naturally overshadowed everything else in the world, but I could not help being aware that the entire Mexican nation had also suffered more of a tragedy than the demolition of its capital city. Ahuitzotl's frantic and rather uncharacteristic plea for Nezahualpili's help in stopping the flood was the last act he ever performed as Yue Tlatawani. He was inside his palace when it collapsed, and, though he was not killed, he would probably have preferred that he had been. 
for he was struck on the head by a falling beam. And thereafter, so I was told, I never saw him again alive. He was as witless as the timber that struck him. He wandered aimlessly about, talking to himself in gibberish, while an attendant followed the once great statesman and warrior everywhere he went, to keep changing the loincloth he kept soiling. Tradition forbade that Ahiwit Sodom be divested of the title of revered speaker as long as he lived, even if his speaking was a babble, and he could be revered no more than could an ambulatory vegetable. Instead, as soon as was practical, the speaking council convened to choose a regent to lead the nation during Ahuitzotl's incapacity. No doubt vengefully, because Ahuitzotl had slain two of their number during the panic on the causeway, those old men refused even to consider the most eligible candidate, his eldest son, Quatemoc. They chose for regent his nephew, Motekuzoma the Younger, because, they announced, Motekuzoma Shokayotsin has proved his ability successively as a priest, a military commander, a colonial administrator. And, having traveled so widely, he has first-hand knowledge of all the farthest Meshika lands. I remembered the words Ahuit Sodal had thundered at me one time. We will not set upon this throne a hollow drum. And I decided that it was probably as well that he was out of his wits when that very thing occurred. If Ahuit Sodal had been killed outright, so that he died in his right mind, he would have clambered up from the nethermost pit of Mictlan and sat his cadaver on the throne, in preference to Motekazoma. As things turned out, a dead ruler might almost have been better for the Mexica. A corpse at least maintains a fixed position. But at that time, I was not at all interested in court intrigues. I was myself preparing to abdicate for a while, and for several reasons. For one, my home had become a place full of painful memories from which I wished to get away. I felt a pain even when I looked at my dear daughter, because I saw so much of Sayanya in her face. For another reason, I thought I had devised a way to keep Kokotin from feeling too poignantly the loss of her mother. For still another, my friend Koskadl and his wife, Kwekwilmikwi, when they came to comfort me with condolences, let slip the news that they were homeless, their own house having been among those toppled by the flood. We are not as downcast about it as we might be, Koskadl said. To tell the truth, we were getting rather cramped and uncomfortable, with our home and the school for servants both under one roof. Now that we are forced to rebuild, we will put up two separate buildings. And meanwhile, I said, this will be your home. You will both live here. I am going away in any case, so the place and the servants will be all yours. I ask only one favor in return. Will you two be substitute mother and father to Kokotin as long as I am absent? Could you play Tene and Tete to an orphan child? Ticklish said, Ay yo, what a lovely idea. Koskadl said, We will do it willingly. No, gratefully. It will be the one time we shall have had a family. I said, The child gives no trouble. The slave turquoise tends to her routine needs. 
you will have to provide nothing but the security of your presence, and a show of affection from time to time. Of course we will, Tickleish exclaimed, and there were tears in her eyes. I went on. I have already explained to Coquitin, meaning I lied to her, about her mother's absence these past several days. I said that her tene is out marketing, buying the necessities she and I will need for a long journey we must undertake. The child only nodded and said, long journey, but it means little to her at her age. However, if you keep reminding Kokochin that her tete and tene are traveling in far places, well, I hope she will have got used to being without her mother by the time I return, so that she will not be too dismayed when I tell her that her tene has not returned with me. But she would get used to being without you, too, Koskadl warned. I suppose so, I said resignedly. I can only trust that, when I do come back, she and I can get reacquainted again. In the meantime, if I know that Kokotin is well cared for, and is loved, she will be, Ticklish said, laying a hand on my arm. We will live here with her for as long as need be, and we will not let her forget you, Michli. They went away, to prepare for the moving in of what possessions they had saved from the ruins of their own house. And that same night, I put together a light and compact traveling pack. Early the next morning, I went into the nursery and woke Kokotin, and told the sleepy little girl, Your tene asked me to say goodbye for us both, small crumb, because, because she cannot leave our train of porters, or they will scatter and run away like mice. But here is a goodbye kiss from her. Did not that taste exactly like her kiss? Surprisingly, it did, to me at least. Now, Kokotin, with your fingers, lift Tene's kiss from your lips and hold it in your hand, like that, so your Tete can kiss you too. There. Now take mine and hers and hold them both tight in your hand while you go to sleep again. When you get up, put them safely away and keep the kisses to return to us when we come back. Come back she said drowsily, and smiled her Zayanya smile, and closed her Zayanya eyes. Downstairs, Turquoise sniffled, and Starsinger several times blew his nose as we said our goodbyes, and I charged them with the management of the household, and reminded them that until my return they were to obey Koskadl and Quakewilmikwi, as their lord and lady. I paused once more on my way out of town, at the house of Pokteka, and left there a message to be carried by the next merchant train going in the direction of Tequantepec. The folded paper was to advise Bayou Ribe, in the least hurtful word pictures I could compose, of her sister's death and the manner of it. It did not occur to me that the normal flow of Mexica commerce had been considerably disrupted, and that my message would not soon be delivered. Tenochtitlan's fringe of Chinampa had been underwater for four days, at the season when the crops of maize, beans, and other staples were just sprouting. Besides drowning those plants, the water had also invaded the warehouses, kept stocked for emergencies, and ruined all the dried foods stored in them. So, for many months, the Mexica, Pocteca, and their porters were occupied solely with supplying the destitute city. That kept them constantly traveling, 
but did not take them far afield. And that is why Waiting Moon did not learn of Sayanya's death until more than a year after it happened. I was also constantly traveling during that time, wandering like a milkweed puff wherever the winds might blow me, or wherever some scenic vista beckoned me closer, or wherever a path meandered so tantalizingly that it was forever seeming to say, Follow me. Just around the next bend, there is a land of heart's ease and forgetfulness. There never was such a place, of course. A man can walk to the end of all the roads there are, and to the end of his days. But he can nowhere lay down his past and walk away from it and never look back. Most of my adventures during that time were of no special account, and I sought to do no trading nor to burden myself with acquisitions. And if there were fortuitous discoveries to be made, like the giant tusks I found that other time I tried to walk away from woe, I passed them unseen. The one rather memorable adventure that I did have I fell into quite by accident, and it happened in this way. I was near the west coast, in the land of Naoyar Ishu, one of the remote northwestern provinces or dependencies of Michihuacan. I had wandered up that way just to see a volcano that had been in violent eruption for almost a month and threatened never to stop. The volcano is called Seboruko, which means to snort with anger. But it was doing more than that. It was roaring with rage, like the overflow of a war going on down below in Mictlan. Gray-black smoke billowed from it, shot with jacinth flashes of fire, and towered up to the sky and had been doing that for so many days that the whole sky was dirty, and the whole of Naoyar Ishu in day-long twilight. From that cloud constantly rained down a soft, warm, pungent gray ash. From the crater came the incessant angry growl of the volcano goddess Chantico, and gouts of fiery red lava and what looked from a distance like pebbles being tossed up and out, though they were, of course, immense hurled boulders. Seboruko sits at the head of a river valley, and its outpour found its easiest course along that riverbed. But the water was too shallow to chill and harden and stop the molten rock. The water simply shrieked to an instant boil when they met, and then steamed away before the onslaught. As each successive wave of hot, glowing lava vomited from the crater, it would surge down the mountainside and down the valley, then flow more slowly, then merely ooze as it cooled and darkened. But its hardening provided a smoother slide for the next gush, which would run farther before it stopped. So by the time I arrived to see the spectacle, the molten rock had, like a long red ton, lapped far down the retreating river. The heat of liquefied rock and sizzling steam was so intense that I could get nowhere near the mountain itself. Nobody could, and nobody else wanted to. Most of the people living thereabouts were glumly packing their household belongings to get farther away. I was told that past eruptions had sometimes devastated the entire river valley as far as the sea coast, perhaps twenty one lawn runs away. And so did that one. I have tried to convey the fury of the eruption, reverend scribes, 
just so you will believe me when I tell how it finally flung me right off the one world and out into the unknown. Having nothing else to do, I spent some days ambling along beside the river of lava, or as close as I could walk beside its scorching heat and unbreathable fumes. While it implacably boiled away the river water and filled its bed from bank to bank, the lava moved like a wave of mud, at about the pace of a man's slow walk. So, when each night I made camp on higher ground, and I ate from my provisions, and rolled into my blanket, or hung my guiche between two trees, I would wake in the morning to find that the moving rock had so far outdistanced me that I would have to hurry to catch up with its forward edge. But the mountain, Seboruko, though it diminished behind me, continued to spew. So I kept on accompanying its outpour, just to see how far the lava would go. And after some days, it and I arrived at the western ocean. The river valley there squeezes between two highlands and deep ouches into a lawn deep crescent of beach embracing a great bay of turquoise water. There was a settlement of reed huts on the beach, but no people anywhere about. Clearly the fisher folk, like those farther inland, had prudently decamped. But someone had left a small sea-going acolai drawn up on the beach, complete with its paddle. It gave me the notion of paddling out into the bay to watch from a safe distance when the seething rock met the sea. The shallow river had been unable to resist the lava's advance, but I knew the inexhaustible waters of the ocean would stop it. The encounter, I thought, would be something worth seeing. It did not happen until the next day, and by then I had put my traveling pack in the canoe, and paddled out beyond the breakers, and I sat in the very middle of the bay. I could see through my topaz how the evilly smoldering lava spread and crept across the beach, advancing toward the waterline on a broad front. Not much was visible in land, except that I could just make out through the obscuring smoke and falling ash, the pinkish flare and occasional brighter yellow twinkle of Seburuko still vomiting from the bowels of Miktlan. Then the undulant, glowing red muck on the beach seemed to hesitate and gather itself, so that, instead of creeping forward, it launched itself ferociously into the ocean. During the days previous, up the river, when the hot rock and cold water had met, the sound had been an almost human screech and a hissing gasp. At the seaside, the sound was the thunderous bellow of an unexpectedly wounded god, a shocked and outraged god. It was a tumult compounded of two noises, an ocean heated to boiling so suddenly that it exploded into steam, and a lava chilled to hardness so suddenly that it exploded into fragments all along its leading edge. The steam towered up like a cliff made of cloud, and a hot spray came drizzling down on me, and my acolyte jolted backward so abruptly that I nearly fell out of it. I clutched at its wooden sides, and so dropped the paddle overboard. The canoe continued its backward swoop as the ocean recoiled from the suddenly unfriendly land. Then the sea recovered from its apparent surprise, and sloshed toward the beach again. But the molten rock was still advancing. The thunder was uninterrupted and the cloud clawed upward 
as if trying to reach the sky where clouds belong. And the affronted ocean recoiled again. That whole vast bay surged seaward and landward again more times than I could count, for I was quite dizzied by the rocking and yawing of my canoe. But I was aware that each revulsion took me farther from land than each resurgence took me back. In the swirling waters about my curveting canoe, fish and other sea creatures floated on the surface, most of them belly up. All the rest of that day, as the twilight got ever darker, my acoli continued its progress of one wave shoreward, three waves seaward. With the very last of daylight, I saw that I was precisely between the two headlands of the bay entrance, but too far from either to swim the distance, and that beyond them was a limitless empty ocean. There was nothing I could do, except two things. I leaned from the canoe and plucked out of the water every dead fish within my reach, and piled them in one end of my craft. Then I lay down with my head on my damp pack, and went to sleep. When I woke the next morning, I might have thought I had dreamt all that turmoil, except that I was still helplessly adrift in an acoli, and the shore was so far away that its only recognizable feature was the jagged profile of dim blue mountains. But the sun was rising in a clear sky. There was no pall of smoke and ash. There was no erupting seboruco discernible along the distant mountains. The ocean was as calm as Lake Sheltakan on a summer day. Using my topaz, I fixed my eye on the landward horizon and attempted to imprint its profile on my vision. Then I closed my eyes for a few moments before opening them again to see any change from the remembered vision. After doing that several times, I was able to perceive that the closer mountains were moving past the farther ones, from left to right. Obviously, then, I was caught in an ocean current that was carrying me northward, but frighteningly far offshore. I tried swerving the canoe by paddling with my hands on the side away from the land, but I quickly gave that up. There was a swirl in the formerly calm water alongside, and something struck the acoli so hard that it rocked. When I looked overside, I saw a deep gouge in the hard mahogany, and an upright fin, like an oblong leather war shield, slicing through the water nearby. It circled my canoe two or three times before it disappeared with another ponderous swirl of the water, and thereafter I put not so much as a finger beyond the sheltering wood. Well, I thought to myself, I have escaped any dangers posed by the volcano. Now I have nothing to fear except being eaten by sea monsters, or dying of hunger, or shriveling from heat and thirst, or drowning if the sea gets rough. I thought about Quetzalcoatl, the long-ago ruler of the Tolteca, who had similarly floated away alone into the other ocean to the east, and thereby had become the best beloved of all gods, the one god adored by far-apart peoples who had absolutely nothing else in common. Of course, I reminded myself. There had been a crowd of his worshipful subjects on the shore to watch his departure, 
and to weep when he did not turn back, and subsequently to go about informing other people that Quetzalcoatl the man was henceforth to be revered as Quetzalcoatl the god. Not a single person had seen me set off, or knew about it, or was likely, when I never came back, to start a popular demand for my elevation to godhood. So, I said to myself, if I have no hope of becoming a god, I had better do what I can to remain a man as long as possible. I had twenty and three fish, from which I picked and laid aside ten which I recognized as being of edible species. Of those I cleaned two with my dagger and ate them raw, though not quite raw. They had been at least a little cooked in the cauldron of the bay back yonder. The thirteen questionable fish I gutted and filleted, and then, getting my eating bowl from my pack, I run them like rags to extract every drop of their body moisture. I tucked the bowl of liquid and the eight remaining edible fish under the pack, so they were out of the sun's direct rays. Thus, I was able to eat two more fish, still comparatively unspoiled, the next day. But by the third day, I really had to force myself to eat two more, trying to swallow the chunks of them without chewing. They were so slimy and vile. And I threw the reeking last four over the side. For some while after that, my only sustenance, actually just a moistening of my painfully cracked lips, was a very occasional and restrained sip of the fish water from the bowl. I think it was also on my third day at sea that the last visible mountain peak of the one world disappeared below the horizon to the east. The current had carried me entirely out of sight of land, and there was nothing firm anywhere, and that was the first such experience I had ever had in my life. I wondered if I might eventually be cast up on the islands of the women, of which I had heard storytellers tell, though none ever claimed to have been there in person. According to the legends, those were islands inhabited entirely by females, who spent all their time in diving for oysters and extracting the pearl hearts from those oysters which had grown hearts. Only once a year did the women ever see men, when a number of men would canoe out from the mainland to trade cloth and other such supplies for the collected pearls, and, while there, to couple with the women. Of the babies later born of the brief mating, the island women kept only the female infants and drowned the males, or so said the stories. I meditated on what would happen if I should land on the islands of the women, uninvited and unexpected. Would I be immediately slain, or subjected to a sort of mass rape in reverse? As it happened, I found not those mythical islands, nor any others. I merely drifted miserably across those endless waters. The ocean ringed me about on every side, and I was most unhappy, feeling like an ant at the very bottom and center of a blue urn whose sides were slippery and unclimbable. The nights were not so unnerving, if I put away my topaz so I could not see the overwhelming profusion of stars. In the dark, I could pretend I was somewhere safe, anywhere solid, in a mainland forest, or even inside my own house. I could pretend that the rocking boat was a guichet bed of rope-slung netting, 
and thus sleep soundly. During the days, however, I could not pretend that I was anywhere but in the exact middle of that appalling blue, hot, shadeless vastness. Fortunately for my sanity, there were a few other things to see by daylight, besides that unending, uncaring expanse of water. Some of those other things were not particularly comforting to contemplate either, but I forced myself to look at them with my crystal, and to examine them as closely as circumstances permitted, and to speculate on the nature of them. A few of the things I saw, I knew what they were, though I had never seen them before. There was the blue and silver swordfish, bigger than I am, which likes to leap straight up from the water and dance for a moment on its tail. There was the even bigger sawfish, flat and brown, with elongated fins along its sides, like the wavy skin flaps of a flying squirrel. I recognized both of those by their wicked beaks, which the warriors of some coastal tribes use for weapons. I dreaded the moment when one of those big fish would stave in my acolyte with its sword or saw, but none ever did. Other things I saw while adrift on that western ocean were totally unfamiliar to me. There were countless small creatures with long fins, which they used like wings, to spurt from the water and glide prodigious distances. I would have thought them a kind of water insect, but one landed in my canoe, and I seized and ate him instantly, and he tasted like a fish. There were immense blue-gray fish, which regarded me with intelligent eyes and a fixed grin, but they seemed more sympathetic than menacing. Numbers of them would accompany my acolyte for long periods, and entertain me by doing water acrobatics in practiced unison. But the fish that filled me with the most awe and apprehension were the biggest of all great gray ones, which came once in a while to bask on the surface of the sea, one or two or crowds of them, and they might loll round about me for half a day, as if they craved a breath of fresh air and a touch of sun, which is most unfish-like behavior. What was even more unfish-like about them was that they were more huge than any other living creature I have ever seen. I do not blame you, Reverend Friars, if you disbelieve me, but each of those monsters was alone enough to span the plaza outside the window there, and each was of a breadth and bulk to match its length. Once, when I was in the Shokonochko, years before the time of which I now speak. I was served a meal of a fish called the Yeye Michi, and the cook told me that the Yeye Michi was the most tremendous fish in the sea. If what I ate on that occasion was indeed a small slice from one of those swimming great pyramids I was later to meet in the western ocean, well, I am heartily sorry now that I did not seek out and meet and express my admiration for the heroic man, or the army of men, who caught and beached the thing. Any two of those mighty Yeye Michten, as they playfully nudged each other, could have crushed my acolyte and me without even noticing. But they did not and no other such mishap befell me, and on the sixth or seventh day of my involuntary voyage, just in time, 
I had licked my bowl dry of the last trace of fish water. I was gaunt and blistered and flaccid. A rain came sweeping like a gray veil across the ocean behind my craft, and caught up with me and swept over me. I was much refreshed by that, and filled my bowl and drank it empty two or three times. But then I began to worry a little, for the rain had brought with it a wind that put waves on the sea. My canoe bounced and jostled about like a mirrored ship of wood, and very soon I was using my bowl to bail out the water that sloshed in over the sides. But I took some heart from the fact that the rain and the wind had come from behind me, from the southwest, I judged, remembering where the sun had been at the time. So at least I was not being blown farther out to sea. Not that it mattered much where I sank at last, I thought wearily, for it appeared that I would have to sink eventually. Since the wind and rain continued without a pause, and the ocean continued to dance my acoli about, I could not sleep or even rest, but had to keep emptying out the water that sloshed in. I was already so weak that my bowl felt as heavy as a great stone jar every time I dipped and filled and poured it overside. Though I could not sleep, I gradually slipped into a sort of stupor, so I cannot say how many days and nights passed thus. But evidently, during all of them, I continued the bailing as if it had become an unbreakable habit. I do recall that, toward the end, my movements dragged slower and slower and the level of water in the boat was rising more rapidly than I could lower it. When finally I felt the canoe's bottom grate on the floor of the sea, and I knew that it had sunk at last, I could only mildly wonder at my not feeling the water close about me, or the fishes playing in my hair. I must have lost consciousness then, for when I came again to myself, the rain was gone, and the sun was shining brightly, and I looked about me, marveling. I had sunk, indeed, but not to any great depth. The water was only up to my waist, for the canoe had grounded just short of a gravelly beach that stretched out of sight in both directions, with no sign of human habitation. Still weak and limp and moving slowly, I stepped out of the submerged acoli, dragging my soaked pack with me, and waded ashore. There were coconut palms beyond the beach, but I was too feeble to climb or even shake one or to look for any other sort of food. I did make the effort of emptying out the contents of my pack to dry in the sun, but then I crept to the palm shade and went unconscious again. I awoke in darkness, and it took me a few moments to realize that I was not still bobbing about on the sea surface. Where I was... I had no idea, but it seemed that I was no longer alone, for all about me I heard a mysterious and unnerving noise. It was a clicking that came from nowhere and everywhere, no single click very loud, but all of them together making a crackling like an invisible brush fire advancing upon me. Or it could have been multitudes of people trying to steal upon me, but not very stealthily, 
for they were either trampling every loose pebble on the beach or snapping every twig among the beach litter. I started up, and at my movement, the clicking instantly ceased. But when I lay back again, that sinister crepitation resumed. Every time I moved during the remainder of that night, it stopped, then started again. I had not used my burning crystal to light a fire while I was still conscious and the sun was still up, so I had no means of making a torch. I could do nothing but lie uneasily awake and wait for something to leap upon me. Until the first dim light of dawn showed me the source of the noise. At first sight, it made my flesh creep. The entire beach, except for a clearing around the spot where I lay, was covered with green-brown crabs the size of my hand, clumsily twitching and slithering over the sand and each other. They were countless, and they were of a kind that I had never seen before. Crabs are never appealingly pretty creatures, but all that I had previously seen had at least been symmetrical. Those were not. Their two front claws did not match. One claw was a large, unwieldy lump mottled brilliant red and blue. The other claw was plain crab-colored, and it was narrow, like a split twig. Each crab was using its narrow claw like a drumstick to beat upon the big claw as upon a drum, tirelessly and not at all musically. The dawn seemed to be the signal for them to cease their ridiculous ceremony. The numberless horde thinned out as the crabs scattered to their burrows in the sand. But I managed to catch a number of them, feeling that they owed me something for having made me quake so long, awake and anxious in the dark. Their bodies were small, and contained too little meat to be worth digging out of the shell. But their big drum claws, which I roasted over a fire before cracking them open, provided quite a savory breakfast. Full fed for the first time in recent memory, and feeling a bit more alive, I stood up from my fire to take stock of my situation. I was back again on the One World, and certainly still on its western coast, but I was incalculably farther north than I had ever previously been. As always, the sea stretched to the western horizon, but it was oddly much less boisterous than the seas I had known farther south. No tumbling breakers, or even a lively froth of surf, but only a gentle lapping at the shore. In the other direction, eastward, beyond the shoreline palms and other trees, there rose a range of mountains. They looked formidably high, but they were pleasantly green with forests, not like the ugly volcanic ranges of dun and black rock where I had recently been. I had no way of knowing how far I had been carried north by the ocean current, and then by the rainstorm. But I did know that if I merely walked southward down the beach, I would, sometime, get back to that bay near Seboruco, and from there... I would be in familiar country. By staying on the beach, too, I would not have to worry about food and drink. I could live entirely on the drummer crabs and coconut liquid, if nothing else offered. But the plain fact was 
that I had had quite enough of the cursed ocean, and I wanted to get out of sight of it. Those mountains inland were foreign to me, and possibly inhabited by savage people or wild animals of breeds I had never encountered before. Still, they were but mountains, and I had traveled in many other mountains, and I had lived well enough off the provender they offered. Most appealing to me at that moment, though, was the knowledge that the mountains would provide a variety of scenery, which no sea or seaside can ever do. So I stayed on that beach only to rest and regain my strength during two or three days. Then I repacked my pack and turned to the east, and headed for the first foothills of those mountains. It was midsummer then, which was fortunate for me, for even at that season the nights were frigid in those heights. The few clothes and the single blanket I carried were much worn by then, and had not been improved by their lawn soaking in salt water. But had I ventured into those mountains in winter, I would really have suffered for I was told by the natives that the winters brought numbing cold and heavy snows that piled head high. Yes, I finally met some people, though not until I had been among the mountains for many days, by which time I was wondering if the one world had been totally depopulated by Seboruko's eruption or some other disaster while I was away at sea. Very peculiar people they were, too, those people I met. They were called Rara Muri. I assume they still are. A word that means fast of feet, and with good reason, as I shall tell. I encountered the first of them when I was standing on a cliff top resting from a breathtaking climb, and admiring a breathtaking view. I was looking down into an awesomely deep chasm, its sheer sides feathered with trees. Through its bottom ran a river, and that river was fed by a waterfall that hurtled from a notched mountain top on the other side of the canyon from where I stood. The fall must have been almost half of one long run, straight down, a mighty column of white water at the top, a mighty plume of white mist at the bottom. I was looking at that spectacle when I heard a hail. Quiraba! I started, because it was the first human voice I had heard in so long. But it sounded cheerful enough, so I took the word to be a greeting. It was a young man who had shouted, and he smiled as he came along the cliff edge toward me. He was handsome of face, in the way that a hawk is handsome, and he was well built, though shorter than myself. He was decently clad, except that he was barefoot but so was I by that time, my sandals having long ago shredded away. Besides his clean deerskin loincloth, he wore a gaily painted deerskin mantle of a style new to me. It had wrist-length sleeves set into it for extra warmth. As he came up to me, I returned his salute of Quiraba. He indicated the cataract I had been admiring, and grinned as proudly as if he owned it, and said, Basa Seachek, 
which I took to mean falling water, since a waterfall was unlikely to be named anything else. I repeated the word, and said it with feeling, to convey that I thought the water a most marvelous water, falling most impressively. The young man pointed to himself, and said, Tes de Sora, obviously his name, and meaning maize stalk, I later learned. I pointed to myself, and said, Meechli, and pointed to a cloud in the sky. He nodded, tapped his mantled chest, and said, Ra Ra Murime, then indicated me, and said, Chichi Mekame. I shook my head emphatically, slapped my bare chest, and said, Meshikado, at which he only nodded again, indulgently, as if I had specified one of the numberless tribes of the Chichimeca dog people. Not then, but eventually, I realized that the Rara Muri had never even heard of us Mexica, of our civilized society, our knowledge and power and far-flung dominions. And I think they would have cared little if they had heard. The Rara Muri have a comfortable life in their mountain fastnesses, well-fed and watered, content with their own company. So they seldom travel far. Hence, they know no other peoples except their near neighbors, of whom the occasional raider or forager or simple wanderer happens into their country, as I had done. To the north of their territory live the dread Yakai, and no sane people desire close acquaintance with them. I remembered having heard of the Yakai from that scalpless elder Pokhtikadl. Testisora, when later I was able to understand his language, told me more. The Yakai are wilder than the wildest beasts. For loincloths, they wear the hair of other men. They tear the scalp from a man while he yet lives, before they butcher and dismember and devour him. If they kill him first, you see, they count his hair not worth keeping and wearing. And the hair of a woman counts not at all. Any women they catch are only good for eating. After they have been raped until they split up the middle and are of no more use for raping. In the mountains south of the Raramuri live more peaceable tribes, related to them by fairly similar languages and customs. Along the western sea coast live tribes of fishermen, who almost never venture inland. All of those people are, if not what could be called civilized, at least cleanly of body and tidy of dress. The only really slovenly and squalid neighbors of the Rara Muri are the Chichimeca tribes in the deserts to the east. I was as sunburned as any desert-dwelling Chichimecatl, and was as nearly naked. In Rara Muri eyes, I could only be one of that trashy breed, though perhaps an unusually enterprising one to have toiled my way to the mountain heights. I do think that Tess de Sora might at least have taken notice, at our first meeting, of the fact that I did not stink. Thanks to the mountain's abundance of water, I had been able to bathe every day, and, like the Rara Muri, I continued to do so. But, Despite my evident gentility, despite my insistence that I was of the Meshika, 
despite my reiterated glorification of that far-off nation. I never persuaded one single person of the Raramuri that I was not just a Chiche Makame fugitive from the desert. No matter. Whatever they believed me to be, or whatever they thought I was pretending to be, the Rara Muri made me welcome. And I lingered among them for a time, simply because I was intrigued by their way of life and enjoyed sharing it. I stayed with them long enough to learn their language sufficiently to be able to converse, at least with the help of many gestures on my part and theirs. Of course, during my first encounter with Tess de Sora, all our communication was done by gestures. After we had exchanged names, he used his hands to indicate a shelter over his head, meaning a village, I assumed, and said, Guagwe Bo, and pointed southward. Then he indicated to Natiu in the sky, calling him Ta Tavari, or Grandfather Fire, and made me understand that we could reach the village of Guagwe Bo in a journey of three sons. I made gestures and faces of gratitude for the invitation, and we went in that direction. To my surprise, Testisora set off at a lope, but when he saw that I was winded and tired and disinclined to run, he dropped back and thereafter matched my walking pace. His lope was evidently his accustomed way of crossing mountains and canyons alike, for even though I am long-legged, at a walk it took us five days, not three, to reach Gagwe Bo. Early in the march, Tess de Sora gave me to understand that he was one of his village's hunters. I gestured to ask why, then, he was empty-handed. Where had he left his weapons? He grinned and motioned for me to stop walking to crouch quietly in the underbrush. We waited there in the forest for only a little while. Then Tess de Sora nudged me and pointed, and I dimly saw a dappled shape move among the trees. Before I could raise my crystal, Tess de Sora suddenly sprang from his crouch and away, as if he had been an arrow. I had shot from a bow. The wood was so dense that, even with my seeing topaz, I could not follow every movement of the hunt. But I saw enough to make me gape in disbelief. The dappled form was that of a young doe, and she had leapt in flea in almost the same instant Testisora leapt in pursuit of her. She ran fast, but the young man ran faster. She bounded and twisted this way and that, but he seemed somehow to anticipate her every desperate turn. In less time than I have been telling of it, he closed with the doe, flung himself upon her, and with his hands, broke her neck. As we made a meal of one of the animal's haunches, I made gestures of amazement at Testisora's speed and agility. He made gestures of modest dismissal, informing me that he was among the least of the fast of feet, that other hunters were far superior at running, and that in any case a mere doe was no challenge compared to a full-grown buck deer. Then, in his turn, he gestured amazement at the burning crystal with which I had lighted our cooking fire. 
he conveyed that he had never seen such a wondrously useful instrument in the possession of any other barbarian. Meshikadol, I repeated several times in loud vexation. He only nodded, and we left off talking with either our hands or mouths, using them instead to feed hungrily on the tender broiled meat. Gagwe Bo was situated in another of the spectacularly vast chasms of that country, and it was a village in the sense that it housed some twenties of families, perhaps three hundred persons altogether. But it contained only one visible residence, a small house neatly built of wood, in which lived the Si Riyam. That word means chief, sorcerer, physician, and judge, but it does not mean four persons. In a Raramuri community, all those offices are vested in one individual. The C. Riyam's house and various other structures, some dome-shaped clay steam houses, several open-sided storage sheds, a slate floor platform for communal ceremonies. Those sat in the canyon bottom, along the bank of the Whitewater River streaming through. The rest of Gagwe Bo's population lived in caves, either natural or hollowed out from the walls rising on both sides of that immense ravine. That they inhabit caves does not mean that the Raramuri are either primitive or lazy, merely that they are practical. If they wished, they could all have houses as neat as that one of the Si Riyam. But the caves are available, or are easily dug, and their occupants make them cozily habitable. They are partitioned by interior rock walls, into several rooms apiece, and every room has an opening to the outside to admit light and air. They are carpeted with spicy-smelling pine needles, swept out and renewed every day or so. Their exterior openings are curtained, and their walls are decorated with deerskins painted in lively designs. The cave dwellings are rather more comfortable, commodious, and well-appointed than many a city house I have been in. Tess de Sura and I arrived in the village, moving as rapidly as we could, with the burden slung on a pole we carried between us. Incredible as it may sound, in the early morning of that day he had run down and killed a buck deer a doe, and a good-sized wild boar. We gutted and dismembered the animals, and hurried to get the meat to Gagwe Bo while the morning was still cool. The village was being plentifully stocked with food by all its hunters and gatherers, because, Tess de Sora informed me, a Tesquina Puri festival was just about to begin. I silently congratulated myself on my good fortune in having encountered the Rara Muri when they were in a mood to be hospitable. But I later realized that only by ill chance could I ever have found any Rara Muri not enjoying some festivity or preparing for it or resting after it. Their religious ceremonies are not somber, but frolicsome. The word Tesquinapuri can be translated as, let us now get drunk. And in total, those celebrations occupy fully a third of the Raramuri's year. 
since their forests and rivers so freely give them game and other foods, hides and skins, firewood and water. The Raramuri do not, like most people, have to labor just to keep themselves supplied with the necessities of life. The only crop they cultivate is maize, but most of that is not for eating. It is for the making of tesquino, a fermented beverage somewhat more drunk-making than the octoli of us Mexica, and somewhat less so than the chapari honey liquor of the Purampeca. From the lower lands east of the mountains, the Raramuri also gather a chewable and potent little cactus, which they call the Jipuri, meaning the godlike for reasons I shall explain. What with having so little work and so much free time on their hands, those people have good cause to spend a third of the year merrily drunk on Tesquino or blissfully drugged with Jipuri, and joyfully thanking their gods for their bounty. On the way to the village, I had learned from Tes di Sora some fragments of his language, and he and I were communicating more freely. So I will cease mentioning gestures and grimaces, and will report only the content of subsequent conversations. When he and I had given our load of venison to some elderly crones tending great cooking fires beside the river, he suggested that we sweat ourselves clean in one of the steam baths. He also suggested, with nice tact, that after we had bathed, he could provide me with clean garments if I cared to throw my old rags into one of the fires. I was all too willing to comply. When we undressed at the entrance to the clay steam house, I got a small surprise. Seeing Testesora nude, I saw that he had small bushes of hair growing from his armpits, and another between his legs, and I made some comment on that unexpected sight. Testesora only shrugged, pointed to his hairiness, and said, Rara Murime then pointed to my hairless crotch, and said, Chichi Mekame. What he meant was that he was no rarity. The Rara Muri grew abundant imachtli around their genitals and under their arms. The Chichi Meka did not. I am not of the Chichi Meka, I said yet again, but I said it absently for I was thinking. Of all the peoples I have known, only the Rara Muri grew that superfluous hair. I supposed that it was induced by the extremely cold weather they endured during part of each year, though I could not see that a growth of hair in those places was any useful protection against the cold. Another thought occurred to me, and I asked Testesora, Do your women grow similar little bushes? He laughed and said that of course they did. He explained that a sprouting of Yimachtli fuzz was one of the first signs of a child's approaching manhood or womanhood. On males and females alike, the fuzz gradually became hair, not very long hair, and no nuisance or impediment, but undeniably hair. I had already noticed, in the very brief time I had been in the village, that many of the Raramuri women, though well-muscled, were also well-shaped and exceedingly fair of face which is to say that I found them attractive even before I knew of that distinctive peculiarity.
which set me wondering. How would it feel to couple with a woman whose tapili was not forthrightly visible, or faintly veiled by only a fine down, but darkly and tantalizingly screened by hair like that on her head? You can easily find out, said Testisora, as if he had divined my unspoken thought. During the Tess Guinapuri games, simply chase a woman and run her down and verify the fact. When I had first entered Gagwe Bo, I had been the object of some understandably wary and derisive glances from the villagers. But when I was clean, combed, and clad in loincloth and sleeved mantle of supple deerskin, I was no longer eyed with disdain. From then on, except for the occasional giggle when I made an outrageous mistake in speaking their language, the Rara Muri were courteous and friendly to me. And my exceptional size, if nothing else about me, attracted some speculative, even admiring looks from the village girls and unattached women. It seemed there were more than a few of them who would gladly run for me to chase. They were almost always running anyway. All the Rara Mori, male and female, old and young, if they were beyond the age of mere toddling, and not yet at the age of doddering, they ran. At all times of day, except for those intervals of immobility when they were occupied with some task, or were sodden with Tesquino, or dazzled by the godlike Jipuri, they ran. If they were not racing each other in pairs or in groups, they ran alone, back and forth along the floor of the canyon, or up and down the slanting canyon walls. The men usually ran while kicking a ball ahead of them, a carved and carefully smoothed round ball of hard wood as big as a man's head. The females usually ran, chasing a small hoop of woven straw, each woman carrying a little stick with which she scooped up the circlet on the run and threw it farther on, and the other women ran competing to catch up to it first and throw it next. All that frenetic and incessant commotion appeared purposeless to me. But Testisora explained. It is partly high spirits and animal energy, but it is more than that. It is an unceasing ceremony in which, through the exertion and sweat expended, we pay homage to our gods, Ta Tavari and Ka Laumari and Ma Tinieri. I found it difficult to imagine any god who could be nourished by perspiration instead of blood. But the Rara Muri have those three whom Testisora named. In your language, their names would be Grandfather Fire, Mother Water, and Brother Deer. Perhaps the religion recognizes other gods but those are the only three I ever heard mentioned. Considering the simple needs of the forest-dwelling Rara Muri, I suppose those three suffice. Testisora said, Our constant running shows our creator gods that the people they created are still alive and lively, and grateful to be so. It also keeps our men fit for the rigors of the running hunt. It is also practice for the games you will see, or join in, I hope, 
during this festival. And those games themselves are only practice. Kindly tell me, I sighed, feeling rather wearied just by the talk of so much exertion. Practice for what? For the real running, of course. The Ra Raji Puri. He grinned at the expression on my face. You will see. It is the grand conclusion of every celebration. The Tesquinapuri got under way the next day, when the village's entire population gathered outside the riverside wooden houses, waiting for the Sea Rian to emerge and command that the festivities begin. Everybody was dressed in his finest and most colorfully decorated garments. Most of us men in deerskin mantles and loincloths, the females in deerskin shirts and blouses. Some of the villagers had painted their faces with dots and curly lines of a brilliant yellow, and many wore feathers in their hair though the birds of that northern region do not provide very impressive plumes. Several of Gagwe Bo's veteran hunters were already sweating, for they wore trophies of their prowess. Ankle-length robes of cougar hide or heavy bearskin or the thick coat of the big-horned mountain leaper. The Si Riam stepped out of the house, dressed entirely in shimmering jaguar hides, holding a staff topped with a knob of raw silver. And I was so astonished that I raised my topaz to make sure of what I was seeing. Having heard that the chief was also sage, sorcerer, judge, and physician, I had naturally expected to see that luminary in the person of an extremely old and solemn-faced man. But it was not a man, and not old, not solemn. She was no older than I, and pretty, and made more pretty by her warm smile. Your Siriam is a woman? I exclaimed, as she began to intone the ceremonial prayers. Why not? said Testisora. I never heard of any people choosing to be governed by any but a male. Our last Siriam was a man. But when a Siriam dies, every other mature man and woman of the village is eligible to succeed. We all gathered together and chewed much jipuri and went into trance. We saw visions, and some of us went running wildly, and others went into convulsions. But that woman was the only one blessed by the godlight, or at least she was the first to awaken and tell of having seen and talked with Grandfather Fire, with Mother Water, and Brother Deer. She indubitably had been shown upon by the Godlight, which is the supreme and sole requirement for accession to the office of Sirian. The handsome woman finished her chanting, smiled again, and raised her shapely arms aloft in a general benediction, then turned and went back into the house, as the crowd gave her a cheer of affectionate respect. She stays in seclusion? I asked Testisora. During the festivals, yes, he said, and chuckled. Sometimes our people misbehave during a Tesquinapuri. They fight among themselves, 
where they indulge in adulteries, where they commit other mischiefs. The sea Riam is a wise woman. What she does not see or hear about, she does not punish. I do not know whether it would have been regarded as a mischief what I intended to do, to chase and catch and couple with the most delectable available sample of Rara Mori womanhood. But, as things happened, I did not exactly do that, and, far from being punished, I was rewarded in a way. What occurred was that, first, like all the villagers, I made a glutton of myself on venison of various sorts and a tolly mush of maize, and I drank heavily of Tesquino. Then, almost too heavy to stand, almost too drunk to walk, I tried to join some of the men in one of their ball-kicking runs. But I would have been outclassed by them, even if I had been in perfect competing condition. I did not mind. I dropped out to watch a group of females running a hoop-and-stick game, and a certain nubile girl among them caught my eye. And I mean my one eye. Unless I closed the other, I saw two of the same girl. I walked weaving toward her, awkwardly motioning and thickly requesting that she quit the group to essay a different game. She smiled her acquiescence, but eluded my clutching hand. You must catch me first, she said, and turned and ran away down the canyon. Though I had not expected to excel as a runner among the Rara Mori men, I was sure that I could run down any female alive. But that one I could not, and I think she even slackened her pace to make it easier for me. Perhaps I would have done better if I had not been so full of food and drink, especially the drink. With one eye closed, it is hard to judge distances. Even if the girl had stood still before me, I would probably have missed when I grabbed for her. But with both eyes opened, I saw two of everything in my path. Roots and rocks and such. And in trying to run between each two things, I invariably tripped on one of them. After nine or ten falls, I tried to leap over the next doubly seen obstacle, a fairly large rock, and fell across it on my belly, so heavily that all the breath was driven from my body. The girl had been watching me over her shoulder as she did her pretense of fleeing. When I fell, she stopped and came back to stand over my clenched body and said in a voice of some exasperation, Unless you catch me fairly, we cannot play any other game, if you know what I mean. I could not even wheeze at her. I lay doubled up, painfully trying to gasp some air back into me, and I felt quite incapable of playing any further games whatever. She frowned peevishly, probably sharing my low opinion of me. But then she brightened and said, I did not think to ask. Have you partaken of the Japuri? I feebly shook my head. That explains it. You are not so very inferior to the other men. 
they have the advantage of that enhanced strength and stamina. Come, you shall chew some jipuri. I was still curled into a ball, but I was almost beginning to breathe again, and her imperious command allowed of no refusal. I let her take my hand and haul me upright and lead me back to the village center. I already knew what the Japuri is and does, for small quantities of it were imported even into Tenochtitlan, where it was called peyotl, and where it was reserved for the exclusive use of the divinatory priests. The Japuri, or peyotl, is a deceptively meek-looking little cactus. Growing close against the ground, round and squat, the jipuri seldom gets larger than the palm of a hand, and it is scalloped into petals or bulges, so it resembles a very tiny gray-green pumpkin. For its most potent effect, it is best chewed when fresh-picked, but it can be dried for keeping indefinitely. The wrinkled brown wads threaded on strings, and in the village of Gagwe Bo, many such strings hung from the rafters of the several storage sheds. I reached to pluck one down, but my companion said, Wait, have you ever chewed Jipuri? Again, I shook my head. Then you will be a Matuman, one who seeks the godlight for the first time. That requires a ceremony of your purification. No, do not groan so. It need not long delay our, our game. She looked around at the villagers, still eating or drinking or dancing or running. Everyone else is too busy to participate, but the Si Riam is unoccupied. She should be willing to administer the purification. We went to the modest wooden house, and the girl jingled a string of small shells hung beside the door. The chief woman, still wearing her jaguar garments, lifted the door's deerskin curtain and said, Quiraba, and made a gracious gesture for us to enter. Siriam, said my companion, this is the Chichi Mikame named Mitli, who has come to visit our village. As you can see, he is of some age, but he is a poor runner even for one of his advanced years. He could not catch me when he tried. I thought the Jipuri might enliven his old limbs, but he says he has never before sought the godlight. So? The chief woman's eyes twinkled with amusement as she watched me wince during that unflattering recital. I muttered, I am not of the Chichimeca. But she ignored me and said to the girl, Of course, you are eager that he have the Matuan initiation as soon as possible. I will be happy to do it. She looked me appraisingly up and down, and the amusement in her eyes gave place to something else. Whatever his years, this Meechtli seems an estimable specimen, especially considering his base origins. And I will give you one bit of advice, my dear, which you would not hear from any of our males. However rightly you are expected to admire a man's racing competence, it is his middle leg, so to speak, which better demonstrates his manliness. That member may even dwindle from disuse 
when a man devotes all his attention to developing the muscles of his other appendages. Therefore, be not too quick to disdain a mediocre runner until you have examined his other attributes. Yes, Sivriam, the girl said impatiently. I intended something of the sort. You can do so after the ceremony. You may go now, my dear. Go? The girl protested. But there is nothing secret about the Ma Tuan initiation. The whole village always looks on. We will not interrupt the celebration of the Tess Queen of Puri. And this Meechtli is a stranger to our customs. He might be abashed by a horde of staring onlookers. I am not a horde, and it was I who brought him for the purification. You will have him back when it is done. Then you can judge whether he was worth your trouble. I have said you may go, my dear. Throwing a furious look at both of us, the girl went, and the Sirriam said to me, Sit down, guest Meechtli, while I mix you a brew of herbs to clear your brain. You should not be drunk when you chew the Jipuri. I sat down on the pounded earth floor strewn with pine needles. She sent the herbal drink to simmering on the hearth in a corner, and came to me bearing a small jar. The juice of the sacred ura plant, she described it, and using a small feather for a brush, she painted circles and whorls of bright yellow dots on my cheeks and forehead. Now, she said, when she had given me the hot beverage to drink, and it was almost magically bringing me out of my fuddlement. I do not know what the name Meechtli means, but since you are a Matuan seeking the godlight for the first time, you must choose a new name. I nearly laughed. I had long ago lost count of all the old and new names I had worn in my time. But I said only, Meechtli means the sky han thing you Raramuri call a Kuru. It makes a good name, but it should have a descriptive addition. We will name you Su Kuru. I did not laugh. Su Kuru means dark cloud, and there was no way she could have known that that already was my name. But I remembered that Asiriyan was reputedly a sorcerer, among other things, and I supposed that her godlight could show her truths hidden from other people. And now, Sukuru, she said, you must confess all the sins you have committed in your life. My lady, see Riyan, I said, and without sarcasm. I probably have not life enough left in which to recount them all. Indeed, so many. She regarded me pensively, then said, Well, since the true god-light resides exclusively in us Rara Muri, and is ours to share, we will count only your sins since you have been among us. Tell me of those. I have done none, or none that I know of. Oh, you need not have done them. To want to do them is the same thing. To feel an anger or a hatred and a wish to avenge it. 
to entertain any unworthy thought or emotion. For example, you did not wreak your lust upon that girl, but you clearly chased her with lustful intent. Not so much lust, my lady, as curiosity. She looked puzzled, so I explained about the imachtli, the body hair which I had seen on no other bodies, and the urges it had aroused in me. She burst into laughter. How like a barbarian, to be intrigued by what a civilized person takes for granted. I would wager it has been only a few years since you savages ceased to be mystified by fire. When she had done laughing and mocking me, she wiped tears from her eyes and said, more sympathetically, Know then, Su Kuru, that we Raramuri are physically and morally superior to primitive peoples, and our bodies reflect our finer sensibilities, such as our high regard for modesty. So it became the nature of our bodies to grow that hair which you find so unusual. Our bodies thus ensure that, even when we are unclothed, our private parts are discreetly covered. I said, I should think that such a growth in those parts would attract rather than distract notice. Not modest at all, but immodestly provocative. Seated cross-legged on the ground as I was, I could not readily hide the evidence bulging my loincloth, and the sea Riam could hardly pretend not to see it. She shook her head in wonderment, and murmured, not to me, but to herself, mere hair between the legs, as common and unremarkable as weeds between the rocks. Yet it excites an outlander, and this talk of it makes me oddly conscious of my own. Then she said eagerly, We will accept your curiosity as your confessed sin. Now here, quickly, partake of the Jipuri. She produced a basket of the little cactuses, fresh and green, not dried. I selected one that had numerous lobes around its rim. No, take the five-petaled one, she said. The many scalloped jipuri is for everyday consumption, to be chewed by runners who must make a long run or by idlers who merely wish to sit and bask in visions. But it is the five-petaled jipuri, the more rare and hard to find, that lifts one closest to the godlike. So I bit a mouthful of the cactus she handed me. It had a slightly bitter and astringent flavor and she selected another for herself, saying, Do not chew as fast as I do, Matuman Sukuru. You will feel the effect more quickly because it is your first time, and we should keep pace with each other. She was right. I had swallowed very little of the juice, when I was astounded to see the walls of the house dissolving from around me. They became transparent, then they were gone, and I saw all the villagers outside, variously engaged in the games and feasting of the Tesquina Puri. I could not believe that I was actually seen through the walls, for the figures of the people were sharply defined, 
and I was not using my topaz. The too clear vision had to be an illusion caused by the Jupuri. But in the next moment, I was not so sure. I seemed to float from where I sat, and I rose to and through the roof, or where the roof had been. And the people dropped away and became smaller as I soared toward the treetops. Involuntarily, I exclaimed, Ah, yeah. The sea realm, somewhere behind or below me, called, Not too fast. Wait for me. I say she called, but in fact I did not hear her. I mean to say, her words came not into my ears, but somehow into my own mouth, and I tasted them, smooth, delicious, like chocolate. Yet in some manner I understood them by their flavor. Indeed, all my senses seemed suddenly to be exchanging their usual functions. I heard the aroma of the trees and the cook fire's smoke that drifted up among the trees as I was drifting. Instead of giving off a leafy smell, the tree's foliage made a metallic ringing. The smoke made a muffled sound like a drumhead being softly stroked. I did not see, I smelled the colors about me. The green of the trees seemed not a color to my eyes, but a cool, moist scent in my nostrils. A red-petaled flower on a branch was not red, but a spicy odor. The sky was not blue, but a clean, fleshy fragrance, like that of a woman's breasts. And then I perceived that my head was really between a woman's breasts, and ample ones. My sense of touch and feeling was unaffected by the drug. The sea Riyan had caught up to me, had thrown open her jaguar blouse, had clasped me to her bosom, and we were rising together toward the clouds. One part of me, I might say, was rising faster than the rest. My tapuli had already been earlier aroused, but it was getting even longer, thicker, harder, throbbing with urgency, as if an earthquake had occurred without my notice. The sea riam gave a happy laugh. I tasted her laughter, refreshing as raindrops, and her words tasted like kisses. That is the best blessing of the godlight, Su Kuru, the heat and glow it adds to the act of Ma Rakame. Let us combine our god given fires. She unwound her jaguar skirt and lay naked upon it, or as naked as a woman of the Raramuri could get, for there truly was a triangle of hair pointing from her lower abdomen down between her thighs. I could see the shape of that enticing little cushion, and the curly texture of it, but the blackness of it was, like all other colors at that moment, not a color, but an aroma. I leaned close to inhale it, and it was a warm, humid, musky scent. At our first coupling, that imachtly felt crinkly and tickly against my bare belly, as if I were thrusting my lower body among the fronds of a luxuriant fern. 
but soon, so quickly did our juices flow, the hair became wet and yielding, and, if I had not known it was there, I would not have known it was there. However, since I did know that my tapuli was penetrating more than flesh, that it was held for the first time by a densely hair-tufted tapuli, the act had a new savor for me. No doubt I sound delirious in the telling of it, but delirious is what I was. I was made giddy by being at a great height, whether it was reality or illusion. By the oddity of sensing a woman's words and moans and cries in my mouth, not my ears. By the sensing of her skin's every surface and curve and gradation of color as a suddenly distinct fragrance. Meanwhile, each of those sensations, as well as our every move and touch, was enriched by the effect of the Jipuri. I suppose also I felt a tinge of danger, and danger makes every human sense more acute, every emotion more vivid. Men do not ordinarily fly upward to a height. They more often fall down from one, and that is often fatal. But the Sirian and I stayed suspended, with no discernible floor or other support beneath us. And being unsupported, we were also unencumbered by any support. So we moved as freely and weightlessly as if we had been under water, but still able to breathe there. That freedom in all dimensions enabled some pleasurable positions and coilings and intertwinings that I would otherwise have thought impossible. At one point, the sea riam gasped some words, and the words tasted like her ferned tapili. I believe you now, that you could have done more sins than you could tell. I have no idea how often she came to climax, and how many times I ejaculated during the time the drug held us aloft and enraptured. But, for me, it was many more than I had ever enjoyed in such a short time. The time seemed too short. I became aware that I was hearing, not tasting, the sounds, when she sighed, Do not worry, Sukuru, if you do not ever excel as a runner. I was seeing colors again, not scenting them, and smelling odors, not hearing them. And I was descending from the heights of both altitude and exaltation. I did not plummet, but came down as slowly and lightly as a feather falling. The sea riam and I were again inside her house, side by side on our discarded and rumpled garments of jaguar and deerskin. She lay on her back, fast asleep, with a smile on her face. The hair of her head was a tumbled mass, but the imachtli on her lower belly was no longer crisp and curly and black. It was matted and lightened in color by the white of my oma kettle. There was another dried spill in the cleft between her heavy breasts and others elsewhere. I felt similarly encrusted with her emanations and my own dried perspiration. 
I was also terribly thirsty. The inside of my mouth felt as furred as if it had grown immodestly. I later learned to expect that effect, always after chewing jipuri. Moving carefully and quietly, not to disturb the sleeping Si Riyam, I got up and dressed to go and seek a drink of water outside the house. Before departing, I took one final appreciative look through my topaz at the handsome woman relaxed in the jaguar skins. It was the first time, I reflected, that I had ever had sexual relations with any sovereign ruler. I felt rather smugly pleased with myself. But not for long. I emerged from the house to find the sun still up and the celebrations still going on. When, after drinking heartily, I raised my eyes from the dipper gourd, I looked into the accusing eyes of the girl I had earlier been chasing. I smiled as guiltlessly as I could, and said, Shall we run again? I can now partake at will of the Jipuri. I have been properly initiated. You need not boast of it, she said between her teeth. Half a day and a whole night and almost another day of initiation. I gaped stupidly, for it was hard for me to realize that so much time had been compressed into what had seemed so little. And I blushed as the girl went on accusingly. She always gets the first and the best Ma Rakame of the God Enlightened, and it is not fair I do not care if I am called rebellious and irreverent. I have said before, and I say again, that she only pretended to receive the godlight from the grandfather and the mother and the brother. She lied to be chosen as the Si Riyam, only so she can claim first right to every Matuane she happens to favor. That somewhat lessened my self-esteem in having coupled with an anointed ruler, learning that the ruler was in no way superior to any common woman gone astraddle the road. My self-esteem further suffered when, during the remainder of my stay, the Sea Riyam did not again command my attendance on her, Evidently, she wanted only the first and the best that a male initiate could give under the influence of the drug. But at least I was eventually able to mollify the angry girl, after I had slept and recuperated my energies. Her name, I learned, was Virokota, meaning Holy Land which is also the name of that country east of the mountains where the Jipuri cactus is gathered. The celebration went on for many days longer, and I persuaded V. Rikota to let me chase her again. And since I had taken care not to overindulge in food or tesquino, I caught her almost fairly, I believe. We plucked some of the dried jipuri from one of the storage streams, and went together to a secluded and pleasant glade in the forested canyon. We had to chew quite a lot of the less potent cactus to approximate the effects I had enjoyed in the Si Riyam's house, but after a while I felt my senses again exchanging their functions. That time, the colors of butterflies and flowers around us began to sing. The Rikota, of course, also wore a medallion of Imachtli between her legs. In her case, a less crisp, more fluffy cushion. And that was still a novelty to me, 
so it again provoked me to extraordinary enterprise. But she and I never quite achieved the ecstasy I had known during my initiation. We never had the illusion of ascending skyward, and we were conscious at all times of the soft grass on which we lay. Also, V. Ricotta was really very young, and small even for her age, and a female child simply cannot spread her thighs far enough that a man's big body can get close enough to penetrate her to the full length of his tipuli. All else aside, our coupling had to be less memorable than what the C. Rayam and I had done together, because V. Ricotta and I did not have access to the fresh, green, five-petaled, real godlight jipuri. Nevertheless, that young female and I suited each other well enough that we consorted with no other partners during the remainder of the festival, and we indulged many times in the ma rakame. And I felt a genuine regret at parting from her when the Tes Quinapuri concluded. We parted only because my original host, Testisora, insisted, It is time now for the serious running, Su Kuru, and you must see it. The Ra Rajipuri, the race between the best runners of our village and those of Quacho Chi. I asked, Where are they? I have seen no strangers arriving. Not yet. They will arrive after we have gone, and they will arrive running. Guacho Chi is far to the southeast of here. He told me the distance, in the Raramuri words for it, which I forget. But I remember that it would have translated as more than fifteen Mexica one lawn runs, or fifteen of your Spanish leagues. And he was speaking of the distance in a straight line, though in actuality any race in that rugged country has to follow a torturous course around and between and through ravines and mountains. I calculated that in total the running distance from Gagwe Bo to Guacho Chi must have been nearer fifty one lawn runs. Yet, Testisora said casually, to run from one village to the other and back again, kicking the wooden ball all the way, takes a good runner one day and one night. Impossible, I exclaimed. A hundred one lawn runs? Why? It would be like a man running from the city of Tenochtitlan to the far-off Perempe village of Keretaro in the same time. I shook my head emphatically. And half of that in the darkness of night? And kicking a ball as he goes? Impossible. Of course, Testisora knew nothing of Tenochtitlan or Keretaro or their distance apart. He shrugged and said, If you think it impossible, Sukuru, you must come along and see it done. I? I know it is impossible for me. Then come only part of the way, and wait to accompany us home on our return. I have a pair of stout boarhide sandals you may wear. Since you are not one of our village runners, it will not be cheating if you do not run the Ra Rajipuri barefoot as we do. Cheating, I said, amused. You mean there are rules to this running game? Not many, he said, in all seriousness. Our runners will depart from here this afternoon, at the precise instant when Grandfather Fire, he pointed, 
touches his rim to the upper edge of that mountain yonder. The people of Guacho Chi have some similar means of judging that exact same instant, and their runners likewise depart. We run toward Guacho Chi. They run toward Gagwe Bo. We pass at some point between, shouting greetings and raillery and friendly insults. When the men of Guacho Chi get here, our women offer them refreshment and try all manner of wiles to detain them, and so do their women when we get there. But you may be sure we pay no heed. We turn right around and continue running until we are back in our own respective villages. By then, Grandfather Fire will again be touching that mountain or sinking behind it or still some way above it, and accordingly we can determine our running time. The men of Quacho Chi do the same, and we send messengers to exchange the results, and thus we know who won the race. I said, For all that expenditure of time and effort, I hope the winner's prize is something worthwhile. Prize? There is no prize. What? You do all that for not even a trophy? For not even a goal to reach and hold? With no aim or end but to stagger wearily to your own same homes and women again? In the name of your three gods, why? He shrugged again. We do it because it is what we do best. I said no more, for I knew that it is futile to argue any matter rationally with irrational persons. However, I later gave more thought to Testisora's reply on that occasion, and it is perhaps not so nonsensical as it sounded then. I suppose I could not better have defended my lifelong preoccupation with the art of word-knowing if anyone had ever demanded of me to know why. Only six robust males, those adjudged the best runners of Gagwe Bo, were the actual racers in the Ra Rajipuri. The six, of whom Testisora was one that day, were well gorged on the fatigue-averting Jipuri cactus before the event began, and they each carried a small water sack and a pouch of pinoli meal, whose sustenance they would snatch almost without slowing their pace. Also attached to the waists of their loincloths were some small dry gourds, each containing a pebble, whose rattling noise was intended to keep them from falling asleep on their feet. The remainder of the Ra Rajipuri runners comprised every other fit male of Gagwe Bo, from adolescence to men much older than myself, and they went along to help sustain the runners in spirit. Numerous of them had gone on ahead, as early as that morning, they were men who could run remarkably fast for a short time, but tended to weaken over long distances. They posted themselves at intervals along the course between the two villages. As the chosen runners came by, those sprinters would speed alongside them to inspire the racers to their best efforts over each of those intervals. Others of the non-racers carried small pots of glowing coals and torches of pine splints, the latter to be fired after dark to light the racers' way throughout the night. Still other men carried spare strings of dried jipuri, spare sacks of pinoli and water. 
The youngest and oldest carried nothing. Their task was to keep up a continuous shouting and chanting of inspiring encouragement. All the men were painted on the face, bare chest, and back, with dots and circles and spirals of the vivid yellow ura pigment. I was adorned only on my face, for, unlike the others, I was allowed to wear my sleeved mantle. As Grandfather Fire settled toward the designated mountain in the late afternoon, the sea Riam came smiling to the door of her house, wearing her regalia of jaguar skins, holding in one hand her silver knobbed staff, and in the other the yellow painted wooden ball the size of a man's head. She stood there, glancing sideways at the sun, while the racers and all their companions stood nearby, perceptibly leaning forward in eagerness to be off. At the moment Grandfather Fire touched the mountain top, the Siriam smiled her broadest and threw the ball from her threshold among the bare feet of the waiting six racers. Every inhabitant of Gagwe Bo gave an exultant shout, and the six runners were away, playfully kicking the ball from one to another as they went. The other participants followed at a respectful distance, and so did I. The sea Riam was still smiling, when I last saw her, and little V. Ricotta was jumping up and down as gaily as a dying candle flame. I had fully expected the whole crowd of runners to outdistance me in a moment, but I should have guessed that they would not put all their energy into a headlong rush at the very start of the run. They set off at a moderate lope, which even I could sustain. We went along the canyon riverside, and the cheering of the village women, children, and old folks faded behind us, and our own shouters began whooping and bellowing. Since the runners naturally avoided having to kick the ball uphill whenever possible, we continued along the canyon's bottom until its sides sloped and lowered sufficiently for us to climb easily out of it and into the forest to the south. I am proud to report that I stayed with the racers for what I estimate to have been a full third of the way from Gagwe Bo to Guacho Chi. Perhaps the credit should go to the Japuri I had chewed before starting. For several times, I found myself running faster than I ever have done in my life before or since that race. Those were the times when we came up to the posted sprinters and did our best to match their bursts of speed and several times we passed the sprinters from Guacho Chi, they standing, not yet running, stationed to await the coming of their own racers from the opposite direction. Those competitors shouted cheerfully scornful names at us as we went by them, laggards and limpers and the like, especially at me, because by then, I was trailing the rest of the Gakwe Bo contingent. Running full tilt through closely spaced trees and along ravine floors strewn with ankle-twisting rocks was something to which I was unaccustomed at the best of times. But I managed well enough as long as I had light to see. When the glow of afternoon began to diminish, I had to run with my topaz held to my eye, 
and that forced me to slow my pace considerably. As the twilight got darker, I saw the guide lights bloom out ahead of me, where the torchbearers were firing their bundles of splints. But, of course, none of those men would drop back to waste his light on a non-racer. So I was left farther and farther behind the running crowd, and its cries dimmed away. Then, as full darkness closed around me, I saw a red gleam on the ground just ahead. The kindly Rara Muri had not totally forgotten or dismissed their outlander companion, Su Kuru. One of the torchbearers, after lighting his torch, had carefully set down his little clay pot of embers where I was sure to find it. So there I stopped and laid and lit a campfire and settled down to spend the night. I will admit that, despite my ingestion of the jipuri, I was sufficiently tired to have toppled over and slept, but I felt ashamed even to think of it, when every other male in the vicinity was exerting himself to the utmost. Also, I would have been intolerably humiliated, and so would my host village, if when the rival runners from Guacho Chi came along that trail, they had found a Gagwe bow man lying there asleep. So I ate some of my pinoli and washed it down with a drink from my water pouch and chewed on some of the jipuri I had brought, and that revived me nicely. I sat up all night, throwing an occasional stick on the fire, to keep myself comfortable, but not so warm that I might become drowsy. I should be seeing the Guacho Chi runners twice before I again saw Testisora and my other former companions. After the two contingents had passed each other at the midpoint of the course, the rival runners would appear from the southeast and reach my campfire at just about the exact middle moment of the night. Then they would arrive at Gagwe Bo, and turn and come back from the northwest, and pass me again in the morning. The returning Testisora and his fellows would not reach me, so I could again join their run and go home with them, until the midday sun was overhead. Well, my calculation of the first encounter was correct. With the aid of my topaz, I kept watch of the stars, and, according to them, it was the middle of the night when I saw bobbing blobs of firelight coming from the southeast. I decided to pretend that I was one of Gagwe Bo's posted sprinters, so I was on my feet looking alert, before the first of the ball-kicking runners came in sight, and I began to shout, laggards, limpers. The racers and their torch-bearers did not shout back. They were too busy keeping their eyes on the wooden ball, which had lost whatever paint it had worn, and was looking rather splintery and shredded. But the company of other Guacho Chi runners returned my taunts, yelling, Old woman, and warm your weary bones, and such. And I realized that my having laid a fire made me, in Raramuri estimation, seem something less than manly. But it was too late then to douse the fire, and they all dashed past, and became again just wavery red lights, dwindling to the northwestward. After another long time, the sky in the east lightened, and finally, 
Grandfather Fire made his reappearance. And more time passed. Well, as slowly as any aged human grandfather, he crept a third of the way up the sky. It was breakfast time, and, by my calculations, time for the Guacho Chi men to be returning on their homeward run. I faced the northwest, where I had last seen them. Since in daylight there would be no torches to signal their coming, I strained my ears to hear them before they were in sight. I heard nothing. I saw nothing. More time passed. In my mind, I went over my reckoning to find where I had miscalculated, but I could perceive no error. More time passed. I searched my mind to remember whether or not Testisora had ever said anything about the racers taking different routes on their return runs. More time passed, and the sun was almost directly overhead, when I heard a hail. Quiraba! It was a man of the Rara Mori, wearing only a runner's loincloth and waist pouches and yellow designs on his bare skin. But he was no one I recalled ever having seen before. So I took him to be one of Guacho Chi's outpost sprinters. Evidently, he took me to be a Gagwe bow counterpart, for, when I had returned his greeting, he approached me with a friendly but anxious smile, and said, I saw your fire last night, so I left my station and came here. Tell me confidentially, friend, how did your people arrange to detain our runners in your village? Were your women all waiting, stripped naked, and lying compliant? It is a vision pleasant to entertain, I said, but they were not, to my knowledge. I was wondering myself, is it possible that your men are returning by some other way? He started to say, it would be the first time ever, when he was interrupted. We both heard another shout of Quiraba, and turned to see the approach of Testisora and his five fellow racers. They were lurching and reeling with fatigue, and the ball they perfunctorily kicked among them had been worn down to about the size of my fist. We, said Testisora to the man from Guacho Chi, and had to pause to gulp for air. Then he painfully panted, We have not yet met your runners. What trickery? The man said, This sprinter of yours and I were just asking each other what might have become of them. Testisora stared at the two of us, his chest heaving. Another man gasped in a voice of disbelief. They have not yet passed here? As the whole company of Gagwe bow runners straggled up to join us, I said, I asked the stranger if they might have taken a different course. He asked me if your women might have contrived to detain them in your village. There was a general shaking of heads. Then the crowds moved more slowly, as the men looked at one another in bewilderment. Somebody said, softly, worriedly, Our village. Somebody else said, more loudly, with more anxiety, Our women. And the stranger said, his voice quavering, 
our best men. Then there was realization in all their eyes, and shock and anguish. And it was in the eyes of the Guacho Chi man as well. All those eyes turned bleakly to the northwest, and in the brief, breathless moment before the men suddenly left me, all of them running harder than ever, someone among them said just one word. Yakai. No, I did not follow them to Gagwe Bo. I never went back there again. I was an outlander, and it would have been presumptuous of me to join the Rara Muri men in bewailing their bereavement. I realized what they would find, that the Yakai marauders and the Guacho Chi runners had arrived in Gagwe Bo at about the same time, and the runners would have been too tired to have put up much of a fight against the savages. The Guacho Chi men would all have suffered having the scalps torn from their heads before they died. What the Si Riyam and Yan V Rikota and the other Gagwe Bo women would have endured before they died, I did not even want to think about. I presume that the surviving Rara Muri men eventually repopulated their villages by dividing themselves and the Guacho Chi women between the two. But I will never know. And I never saw a Yakai, not then or to this day. I would have liked to, if I could have managed it without the Yakai seeing me, for they must be the most fearsome human animals in existence, and wonderful to look upon. In all my years, I have known only one man who did meet the Yakai, and did live to tell of it. And he was that elder of the house of Pokteka, who had no top to his head. Nor have any of you Spaniards yet encountered a Yakai. Your explorers of these lands have not yet ventured that far north and west. I think I might almost pity even a Spaniard who goes among the Yakai. When the stricken men went running, I stood still and watched them disappear in the forest. I stayed looking toward the northwest for a while after they were out of sight, saying a silent farewell. Then I squatted down and made a meal of my remaining pinoli and water, and chewed a jipori to keep me awake during the rest of the day. I dumped earth on the last embers of my campfire, then stood erect, glanced at the sun for direction, and strode off to the south. I had enjoyed my stay with the Rara Muri, and I grieved at having it end so. But I wore good clothing of deerskin and sandals of boar hide, and I had leather pouches in which to carry food and water, and I had a flint blade at my waist, and I still had my seeing crystal and my burning crystal. I had left nothing behind in Gagwe Bo, unless you count the days that I lived there. But of them I brought away and have kept the memory.